It's that magical time of year. It's Christmas. Up and down the UK, in towns and cities, families are gearing up for that big special day. They're buying presents, eating and drinking, and generally making merry. But as we know, Christmas is a major undertaking that takes planning, organisation, and a lot of hard work. But for some people, it can be a pretty challenging time too. I am very scared. <laughs> Should have used nails. <laughs> Still got Christmas trees to be delivered yet. So we're in the heart of Britain's biggest Christmas market in Manchester to show you just what it takes to get that festive season on track. If we didn't do our job, the city would come to a standstill. Our priority is to get the motorway open and get these people moving again. Someone is falling over getting into a taxi here. The ambulance has already been called. We're going to be meeting stall holders, police officers and organisers who all work tirelessly behind the scenes to make this special time of year safe and joyful for us all. It really does feel like the start of Christmas because everyone's getting together and having a good time. Welcome, Welcome to, to Christmas, Christmas City. City. Gonna be a good Christmas. On today's show, I'm out with the Street Angels. Now, they're a group of volunteers who patrol the streets of Manchester on a Friday night to make sure that your Christmas celebrations end up with nothing more serious than a bit of a sore head in the morning. We've got a guy just on the right-hand side here, guys. If you want to just check he's all right. And I'll be travelling up north to follow the journey of a Christmas tree from the Scottish borders via the Christmas markets to our very own front rooms. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Manchester Christmas markets are in full swing. Over six weeks, nine million visits will be made to stalls selling the whole range of seasonal staples, from glue vine to handmade wooden decorations, and of course, Christmas trees. For many of us, the festive season really begins when we haul a Christmas tree through the front door, put it in our living room and decorate it with baubles and tinsel. So I've come up to Galloway in the Scottish borders to find out more about where our Christmas trees come from. Here on the Garlocker Tree Farm, there's around three quarters of a million of them on over 300 acres. Farm manager Martin McKenzie has been growing Christmas trees for 30 years. Wow! So Christmas must be a bit of a big deal for you. How many Christmas trees do you get through during that period? For this season, we'll be doing between 30 and 40,000. Wow, OK. And we have to do that largely within a two to three week period. So with all these trees to choose from, how do you decide which one gets the chop? It's largely in the eye of the beholder, to be honest. I could show you two or three different trees, which you might think are perfect, I might think are not perfect. Right, OK. I mean, this looks perfect to me because you could put a star on top, you could get your baubles on all here. How, how do you get to that stage? We prune every single tree in the farm to contain its width so the tree doesn't get too wide and also to bulk up the, the density of the so tree. So you shape them as it's growing? Yes. So it gets thicker. You can fit more baubles on. Exactly. The more stems uh -huh. you get. But producing the perfect Christmas tree is a long-term project. We grow the tree for seven to ten years at least. The bigger trees that we're looking at behind you are 15 plus years. With 40,000 trees to cut down, they better get chopping. Do you think I'll be allowed to go, Melton? Yes, I'm sure you can. Okay. It, well, it makes it look so easy. The size is the colour. So blue is a, a six foot. The white tag is the grade of the tree. So it's a premium grade tree. We need 17 of these at the moment. Right, I'm on it. I can feel the tree. Here we go. Timber! Okay, go. Look at that! How do I do, Martin? Is that all right? Perfect. Is it a clean cut? Nice and close to the ground. Perfect. Right, there's another 16 to do. So have I got a job there, Martin? A little more practice, yeah. <laughs> little more practice. It's not as easy as it looks, it's actually. Not, it's quite it's, a heavy machine. It, but it's a lot easier than using a chainsaw or a handsaw yeah. to cut them down. I and bet. a lot safer. Over the years, Martin has earned a number of celebrity Christmas tree clients. One in particular that we're quite proud of that we've supplied for the last seven years is the Ritz Hotel in London. Oh, right. Wow, which tree's theirs, then? The tree that we're just looking at right here. Oh, that is a good tree. It's that is a, a very, very good, good tree. tree. I see what you're talking about. It's very even. 
Mm. It's huge, though, absolutely huge. It's 23 feet from butt to tip. We have to send photographs of the tree from various directions and ensure them that they've got the tree that they want. And did you know when it was a young sapling that it was going to be the tree for the Ritz? Of course I did. <laughs> It's obviously a labour of love for Martin, but it's also a business, and like any farmer, he's always at the mercy of the weather. We're out in the middle of a beautiful day today, but if there's a storm, if there's, if there's weather problems, does it affect your yield? It could affect our ability to extract the trees, or if the roads become blocked, there's always the possibility of snow. Four or five years ago, we had snow drifts on the road up to the farm, which were six, seven feet deep. And if we'd had that at Christmas time, it would have been a disaster for sure. So fingers crossed on that one. After being cut down, the tree is left for three days to enable the sap to firm up, helping to prevent the needles from dropping. Janice might need your help with the lift. Oh, there we go. The trees are then netted up, ready for shipping. Here comes the arm. Wait there, just wait. Whoa, I see what you mean, that's scary. Okay. Right, so now do we inch it forwards? Yep. Ram it in the middle. Yep. One, two, three. That's it. Oh, I see, so it's grabbed it nice and firm. Hold it up so it's okay. central. Yeah. Wow, that's a strong thing. And look at that, it's now half the size as it went in. I could do with one of these slimming machines. <laughs> <laughs> Though I'm getting a pretty good workout loading up these trees. Potentially 4,000 trees in a day will move out. 4,000 in a day. Oh, I'm shattered after seven. <laughs> oh, there we have it. So it's taken eight years for these trees to get to this point, but now they're starting their journey to wholesalers and shops across the whole of the UK. And we're going to catch up with them in Manchester. In Britain, there are over 270,000 licensed taxis and private hire vehicles. The run-up to Christmas is one of the busiest times in a cab driver's calendar, and that means that it's just as hectic for the licensing team, whose job it is to ensure the taxi-travelling public are kept safe. Today, the Thameside licensing team will be conducting spot checks on taxis in their area. Council officer Dave Smith is in charge of operations back at the testing centre. Best your foot, Ray! The reason we do these spot checks is because the vehicles obviously are out all the time. They're very busy vehicles, there's a lot of mileage on those vehicles. Today one of our officers is out with the Great Manchester Police. They'll be pulling vehicles uh, into the garage. When they come into the garage they'll be being tested mechanically. And myself and my colleague will look at the, uh, the driver to make sure they're licensed, make sure they're insured to drive that vehicle. While Dave waits at the garage, his colleague Mike Robinson is out on patrol with two police officers hunting for taxis. We'll pull them over yeah. and we'll ask them to go straight down to, to Thames Street to the garage. With no shortage of cabbies on the roads, a wintry Friday morning is the perfect time for the council to be conducting these spot checks. There's one there. We're just running a spot check operation this morning. We'll just do a quick spot check of the vehicle for a compliance test. OK, thank you very much. Head down to Thames Street after you've dropped your fare off. All right, no problem. All right, thanks very much. Cheers. Mike takes a photo of each vehicle's taxi licence, which he sends to his colleagues at the garage. If any of the vehicles he's pulled over fails the test, then the driver will automatically lose their right to carry paying passengers. Back at the depot, the spot checks are now flooding in. So what you need to do is you need to go get yourself a tariff sheet. Yeah. Um, and you also need to go home and get your first aid kit. Oh. And that needs to be in the vehicle. Just going to check your seat belts, Kaiser, all right? You know, in the event of a crash? Yeah, sometimes, yeah, it's happening. But that needs to lock. So that type of movement needs to be locking it, not, not once every six or seven attempts the first time. 
the driver wants to hold off getting the faulty seatbelt repaired until the vehicle's next MOT, but there is no way that Dave is going to let a vehicle with this safety issue out on the snowy Christmas streets. The taxi will be unable to pick up fares until the seatbelt is fixed. I know you're gutted and probably angry about the seatbelt issue, and I, and I get that, I understand that, and it's not that we're trying to stop you working, but if I get in your taxi tonight, and I had a member of my family sat in that seat, and you're involved in a bump, and that seatbelt didn't work. Do you know what I mean? It's, it doesn't bear thinking about. Back out on the icy streets, Mike and the police patrol are really hitting their stride. You got your badge on, it's that's great. Yeah. Um, I'm Mike from Licensing. Hopefully she'll be on your way as soon as possible. All right. All right, thanks very much. Are you able to take the vehicle down Thames Street? Right now? Yeah, if you could, please. And for this Thameside taxi driver, he could be losing fares not just today, but over the festive season too, if his vehicle is proven to be unroadworthy. Crosby's White Christmas is the best-selling Christmas single ever, selling over 50 million copies worldwide since 1942. Christmas just wouldn't be Christmas without some festive tunes. For businesses, creating that perfect ambience during the festive season is crucial, and that's exactly what's brought together one of the city's oldest businesses with one of its newest. There are few names as famous as Forsyths in the grand world of the piano. From their Manchester base, they sell, restore and tune one of the widest ranges of instruments in the country. The shop itself houses a show-stopping display of pianos, ranging from £400 to a concert grand that will set you back over £100,000. And over the festive period, these pianos will be dispatched to the homes of the rich and famous. Two, three. Or take their place on international stages. Today, fifth generation piano connoisseur Simon Lote runs the business. Almost like we did it before. We started in 1857 when Charles Halley was invited to come to Manchester to start the orchestra. He was delighted to come up, but he didn't know how to run a business, run an orchestra. So he invited his friends, the Forsyth brothers, to help him run the orchestra. And he suggested they could open a, a music shop at the same time. Nowadays, their customers include Gary Barlow and David Beckham, to name a few. But at Christmas time, they attract an even wider clientele. We don't always get the same type of customers we get during the rest of the year, because normally we get a musician buying for himself. But at Christmas, we get family members buying for another family member or buying for a musical friend, and they're not necessarily musical themselves. You got it, Chris? Yep. But today, they're awaiting a slightly different type of customer. So this is the workshop. This is where we'll put the piano on its feet, unwrap it, and check it out. One of Manchester's newest and most luxurious five-star hotels wants one of their pianos to form a Christmas centrepiece in their restaurant. They were wondering about the possibility of being able to have a piano for Christmas. They wanted it in the restaurant area, they thought it would be nice for creating an, a good mood. His customer has arrived. Mario is the manager of the Gotham Hotel. He wants to add a Christmas sparkle to this year's festivities in his upmarket restaurant. Christmas is coming to town, as we know, and it's a high time to get ready and be as Christmassy as possible. So I'm here because I'm looking to get a nice baby grand piano for the festive season. I put the order in about four weeks ago, and no, I haven't seen the piano just yet, so that's why I'm excited today. Hello, young sir. You all Hi, right? Hi, Mario. Good to see you. Hi, quite. You all right? So we just got it out of our basement this morning. It looks lovely. It looks perfect. The £15,000 piano has travelled from China by boat to take centre stage at the hotel. But its next journey to the sixth floor restaurant could be its most perilous. The only route is via the customer lift. Everybody told me there was no way you get a piano in that lift. He was walking around with a tape measure, so... Uh... <laughs> is that it? Two centimetres at each end? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it won't fit. <laughs> but the only plan B will, have, will be a crane. Let's, yes. let's hope we don't have to resort to that. I'd be much happier if Simon gets it in a lift and, and 
set up in half an hour, as he promises. All right, where's the tape measure? <laughs> yeah. We're back in the garage with licensing officers from Tameside Borough Council. The stuff in the windows needs to come off. This blue taxi has been sent in for testing by a team out patrolling the streets. That means the driver is losing business during the busiest time of the week and he's not happy about it. Why can't we do this on a Tuesday when it's dead or a Monday when it's dead? Because vehicles don't come out because it's dead. And we need to be able to get to vehicles to uh, bring them in. Dave has gone through the disgruntled driver's documents and everything is in order. It's not this one I'm going to do, one. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Hello. Now it's his vehicle's turn for the once over. Time reverse and your hazard lights. And it doesn't take the mechanic long to unearth a problem. I really have to do an emission test on it. Ah, look at that. At the far end of the garage, licensing officer Gemma Lee is giving another cabbie a clean bill of health. He's got his checkbook filled in, he's doing the vehicle maintenance checks regularly. He's got all his credentials with him, insurance certificate, logbook, everything, all in a little wallet in his glove box. That's how we want it, really. But now it's the moment of truth for the blue minivan. Fail the emission test and its taxi plates will be temporarily removed, resulting in an unwelcome weekend off for its driver. clearly failed the emissions test. It seems to be that it, it's failed that bad. It's, it's done something to the computer, so we can't even print off the document. It looks like Gemma is going to be the bearer of some bad news. Just on the emissions test, yeah. unfortunately, the vehicle's failed. Okay. Um, it seems to be that we're not able to get a reading off it because of the amount of smoke that it was right. it's giving off. So, unfortunately, it's going to be plates taken off today. Right. Um, I'm going to instruct you not to do anything. Don't have any repairs done yet. I'll give you a copy of this so you can well, see. Well, I can't have any repairs done. Because what we're going to do is we're going to check the test history of the vehicle um, and then obviously make a decision then. So, um, this afternoon or late this Monday, I'll be in touch with the arm, Dave Will, and then obviously we can take it from there because the plate's going to be off the vehicle. Right, okay. No, that's is that problem. okay? At first, the cabbie takes it on the chin, but as the council workers complete their duties, his mood takes a definite turn for the worse. He failed it. I've got a problem with that. And that's, that's the way it is. And it's, it's, better, it's better that it's failed, to be honest, because then it'll get something to get done about it. Exactly, yeah. But why leave the engine on? Why yeah. leave the engine on when it's failed? Let's just I think, down. I think Let's what we need to do is... I, I normally come in for a test. I'm normally here for half an yeah. hour, 20 minutes. Unfortunately, when it's a spot check, it is like this. Unfortunately, we have to get vehicles in, and it's a bit like a conveyor belt. I am sorry you feel aggrieved you've been waiting I am quite a little a bit, long, to be honest, yeah. quite long. I understand that. But unfortunately, that's the way it is. When we're well, out okay, giving spot checks, that and, 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 and that's exactly that. how it will be. Whenever you're involved in a spot check again, you will have to wait, unfortunately. But it isn't acceptable to speak to somebody in that manner. You know that as well as I do. I do, yeah, exactly. OK, thank you. Eventually, Gemma is able to calm him down, but the cabbie is still struggling to come to terms with an enforced weekend off the road. If they've took this off, which is a good idea, you know why? If it's not right, it shouldn't be on, and I agree with that. From that point of view, everything's right. I haven't got a problem with that. What I've got a problem with is, is why not do this on a Monday or Tuesday when it's quiet, or not on a day when it's Friday and Saturday are our, our busiest days. It's not a case of we think, oh great, it's a Friday, let's target a Friday. We do do these operations throughout the year around various different days. Um, it's just unfortunate for him now, obviously. Um, his plates are off, he's going to be like that over the weekend. We can't be having a vehicle driving around that isn't roadworthy to do so. The licensing team are winding up their operation for the day. Two potentially dangerous cabs have been taken off the road for repairs and Dave can reflect on a job well done. Yeah, the operation this morning has been uh, quite a success, really. Um, unfortunately, we've had vehicles that have failed, um, but we've caught them and they have been taken off the road, which is always a positive. It's important that the vehicles, certainly around the Christmas period, are in top nick because they're going to be extremely busy. It's the beginning of an anxious day for Manchester's oldest music shop. After a week in the workshop being tuned, they're due to deliver a £15,000 piano to a luxury hotel in the city centre. Come on then, let's get started. 
It's a delicate operation, and shop owner Simon is travelling with it every step of the way. Slightly concerned that the lift is very, very tight. I had a look at it uh, yesterday, and the lift was smaller than I remembered. Oh, no. It's very hard to tell because of the curve of the piano. We were slightly worried it's going to be just a bit too long. <laughs> when the lift doors close, then I'll be able to relax. It's a nervous wait for Hotel Gotham's manager, Mario, who's pinning his hopes on the piano becoming a real showstopper in his sixth floor restaurant. But the practicalities of running a hotel in a listed building are a constant challenge. The plan for the piano is to come through our main uh, guest list. This is a listed building and everything in it had to be made to fit the building. So what I'm hoping really is that the, uh, the actual piano is not much bigger than me. Back at the shop, the baby grand is on the move. So we have our best piano movers here today. Uh, the, the Gilbert brothers, Wayne and Neil, they're absolutely fantastic. They've been moving pianos all their working lives. And if anybody can get the piano in there, they can. So we're all loaded now, and then we find out if it fits. At the hotel, Mario is anxious to cover all bases and has a plan B in place, but it's an expensive last resort. If the piano doesn't fit into our uh, guest lift, we would have to hire a crane, probably stop the traffic around the building as well, and then lift the piano seven floors up and then physically carry it one flight of stairs down into a restaurant on the sixth floor. I'm desperate for that not to happen. Hi, Mario. Hello. Welcome, nice to see you. Thank you, you. good to see you, yes. We've just finished exceptionally busy breakfast service. We're on very tight time schedule to turn the room around for lunch, and the piano has to be fully in place in time for that. So the time is at the premium. I am very scared. <laughs> Come on then, Wayne, let's have a look. I actually woke up at 4.30 this morning thinking, will it fit in the lift? The problem is that's where the door's wider. Uh, they've done this before. To Simon's relief, they've made it with less than a millimetre to spare. Can you press the button? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only problem. Where are we going? Six? It's on its way up. It's so... a good time. The piano might have made it to the sixth floor, but until it's set up and working, they're not out of the woods. It's a lot heavier than it looks, I promise you. And there's bad news. There's something wrong with the piano. Yeah. It's fallen out, hasn't it? The rod that lifts the damper tray, that lifts all the dampers up when you press the pedal down, uh, has come out of position when we turn the piano on its side. There's only one thing for it. Simon will have to strip the piano down, and it's a race against time. Right, we have um, exactly an hour until the first lunch table uh, arrives. Is that it? No. But it doesn't seem to be jamming on anything, I don't... There we go, is that it? At last, there's some news. Wayne tells me we've managed to get it located back in. Watch your enough. fingers. Yeah, so now it's doing what it's supposed to do. But the show's not over yet. This is no ordinary piano, and Simon has a final trick up his sleeve. There's something somebody at work recorded earlier. Was it you at four o'clock this morning? Ah. See? Christmas at Gotham. The piano has a library of built-in music that it can play by itself. I think a uh, difficult job well done. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a Merry well Christmas. Done. Thank you, you too. Ah, that's a relief.
a staggering 300,000 tonnes of card and paper are generated by UK households every festive season. That's enough to wrap around Big Ben 260,000 times. Thankfully, a dedicated team working behind the scenes clear that rubbish to keep our cities clean. But it's not just households that generate plenty of trash. Businesses and restaurants in our towns and cities also add to the waste. Rubbish collectors Stuart and Alex do their bit to make sure Manchester scrubs up well for the festive season. Yeah, that's cool. All right. It's the busiest time of the year. Restaurants especially, we do food and glass vehicles. The restaurants especially, they get really busy and then obviously the, the amount that we collect pretty much doubles. They've had a few early morning surprises in their time. I've moved a bin and the homeless guy's jumped out of the bin and gone running off and you're like, yeah, I'm glad you didn't go in. They're out and about collecting waste from hotels and restaurants across the city, ready to be recycled. We've actually got to do a site clearance at the Hilton. Well, they told you early, I think, didn't they? Yeah, because it was flooded yesterday. The furthest one out that we've got to go to is Malmaison, so... Some customers over the Christmas period will phone up for extra bins knowing they're going to get a rush, but some people will just pile, pile the bins high so the lids are up here and then obviously we end up with a mess everywhere when the bins are trying to be emptied, stuff falls out. I'd say the most difficult thing for my job is getting into the tight alleyways because when people are driving the cars they don't realise how difficult it is to get a vehicle that size in a little alleyway. Come on, you can move a bit more over please you need somebody looking in the blind spots all the time because I've been turning and there's somebody on the phone or there's a bloke, I've not seen him for a bit, he'd walk around with a book in front of his face like that, walking around and it's just like, come on. All right. On an average day, I'll collect, say, 18 tonnes of waste. Unless you, you see how much waste that is, you don't actually realise how much there is lying around. The idea was this. I think if we didn't do our job, the city would come to a standstill. It's six in the morning, and these Christmas trees have just arrived at New Smithfield Wholesale Market in Manchester after a 200-mile journey from Garlocker Tree Farm in Scotland. It's a very good growing area where they come from. If I could buy all my trees from Scotland, I would do. Keith Lowry runs a company supplying businesses with fruit and veg, but over the festive season, Keith swaps pineapples for pine needles. Christmas trees are only two months of the year, uh, and we're a catering company that runs 12 months of the year. Thank you. You're out of condition, Martin. You're out of condition. And you are. <laughs> well, I would say we're the main supplier in Manchester, yeah. But we go all over the country as well. We'll deliver 7,000 trees out over the next five or six days. No. In the 47 years he's been supplying Manchester with trees, Keith has seen a change in consumer habits. <laughs> it was at one time we sold double what we're selling now, but now it's just coming back again. Where the trees went too expensive, so people did move on to uh, artificial trees. But now they're moving back to real trees again. It's only once a year and, and it's different than an artificial one. You get the, the smell of a real Christmas tree. New Smithfield Market is now open for business and florist Anthony Cox is on the hunt for Christmas trees. Morning. Morning, Anthony. Morning. Nice to meet you. Right. What are you looking for today, Anthony? I need a big 14 footer, right. eight footers, and then I just need, I only need six, six footers to start with and then We'll just go as we go from there, so... Right. OK. Anthony is not only looking to pick up trees to sell on his flower stall, but he also needs one very special tree that he wants to donate to a city centre church. 
it's for the big St Anne's Church, so I mean, they've got masses of room to fill. Well, maybe we can... We can just have a quick gander. This whopping 15-foot Nordman fir that's taken 20 years to grow could be just what Anthony is looking for. Can you put it down? I can tell you now I'll have that. Don't bother. We'll have that. I just want to see you drag it to the van. That's a bit funny, this thing. And when it comes to Christmas trees, size really does matter. Last year it was really difficult to get hold of, of a good tree like that. That's unbelievable. Um, we could only get like a 12 foot last year, but that's like 15 foot. Because St Anne's is like the first church of, of Manchester, so it was, and it's the centre of Manchester as well, so everybody goes every year to see like their Christmas tree, so it's, it's important we, we put a good one on. That'll keep me in the good book for another year. Anthony might be in the good books thanks to his very large donation, but will he be able to balance the books and make a profit from the other trees? <laughs> Last five years, he's been running a flower stall next to St Anne's Church in Manchester. So there's been a flower stall here since 18, 1892. It was in one family for 112 years, the Fitzgeralds. As the new owner of the flower stall, Anthony is keen to keep up old traditions. We provide in the church basically because it's just it's just the right thing to sort of do. It's just what we like to do, and it keeps up traditions. It's what what's always happened here. So we provide the tree, and obviously, if it's been a tradition, we always want it to be the biggest tree they've ever had, the best tree they've ever had. And this year is no exception. Thanks to Anthony's generous donation, this magnificent tree will take pride of place at St Anne's Church once they get it through the front doors. But the hard work doesn't end with this enormous tree. The big challenge for Anthony will be to shift the other six six-foot Christmas trees on his stall. And with only one in five of us opting to buy a real tree, this could be difficult. But Anthony thinks he's found a solution. He might be located in one of the oldest parts of the city, but he's going to use one of the newest of technologies to drum up business. We'll try and do things slightly bit different. We almost want to keep the concept of that we are a traditional old school market because that's where my upbringing was, that's where we, what I've come from. So it's trying to do it in a sort of modern way. We'll get it out on Facebook, straight out on Twitter, and we'll see by the end of the day. I could sold any. New media might have helped to pull the punters in, but it's going to take a bit of old-fashioned hard sell from Anthony to seal the deal. That one's been out since this morning. That's still probably another five or six hours to rest. So you'll get all them to come down. That'll come down a bit more. That's a really nice one, isn't it? Very symmetrical. The only reason why I pull that out of there is because I know it's the best one I've got. <laughs> If you want that tree, it can go back, go back to our warehouse, and I can look after it. It's, it's always the way with a tree. Once you've seen one, you never want any other one. I'm saying nothing, but I know what tree you're going to be buying. Because you always go back to your first one. But perhaps it hasn't worked this time. Anthony is still confident. I'll give her ten minutes until she's back buying that tree. That's why we pulled that one out. You know, from the weight of it, instantly it's the perfect tree. And a good market trader knows his customer. Sold. Sorry. Just sold now to that young lady over there. What was it? Two hours? Three hours? Two hours? It's not a bad start. It's been here for two hours. It'll go on the van. And within half an hour, someone will be having tinsel on it. The lovely. This beautiful Nordman fir that started life on a Scottish hillside will now end its journey in a Manchester living room, where it will be decorated and enjoyed throughout the Christmas celebrations. It's good, it means that's it. I can get up now in the morning and go and buy some more and get them out tomorrow, cos we'll sell, we'll sell our trees, fingers crossed. So, yeah, it's good. For many of us, Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without a drink. In fact, during December, we Brits spend a staggering £2.3 billion on booze alone. 
As Christmas kicks off, millions of us will be enjoying ourselves by partying in city centres up and down the country. And although most of us will be enjoying ourselves responsibly, there are some who will take it to excess. And when that happens, it puts a massive amount of strain on the emergency services. So who do they turn to when they need an extra bit of help? Manchester Street Angels is a voluntary organisation who patrol the city centre streets. Similar initiatives operate all over the country. They help people who have found themselves in trouble during a night out. By day, Andy Poyser works in accounts. By night, he patrols the streets of Manchester. Andy, this is it. You're about to go out on your first patrol of the night. You're going to let me come with you. What are you expecting to find tonight? We're going to see some people that maybe have already started drinking, had too much to drink. We're going to help them out. We're going to look out for people that are on their own, that are lost or vulnerable. But the first step tonight, there's actually a briefing with the police, who you're obviously working quite closely with. What's that going to involve? Yeah, basically we attend the police briefing before we go out each night and they'll tell us anything, any major events that are happening in the city centre, anything to look out for in particular. And yeah. the briefing's happening shortly, so we let's, need go. To go. Let's, sure. go. let's go. The volunteers work very closely with Greater Manchester Police. Inspector Christopher Hadfield is in charge of policing the city's streets tonight. Right, evening everyone. OK, for those who have done it before and haven't, Zone 1, staff, that's the northern quarter, the print works, and Deansgate. Zone 2, the locks, Peter Street and Castlefield. And Zone 3 is the village, Piccadilly and Piccadilly Gardens. OK, what events have we got on tonight? We've got the warehouse project at Store Street, 1800 capacity dance venue. As we say, we've got four officers deployed to that already. Billy Connolly's performing, that finishes at 11 o'clock. England and Scotland, anyone got the final score on that? 3-0 to us, OK. <laughs> We've got the Manchester Street Angels, welcome. You guys have had first aid and conflict training. Manchester Street Angels is a charity that was set up following the death of Adam Pickup, a young lad from Bramhall who went out one night, sadly, with a group of friends and didn't come home. On the back of that, lots of people got together and as a movement of people, they decided to do something to try and help other people that might be in that position. All Manchester Street Angels are volunteers. They all give the time freely. We all have the common aim of helping people to get home safely after having a night out in Manchester. Hey Andy, we just had the briefing. Quite a lot of information there to take in. Yeah, there's a lot of information. Obviously this weekend is the first weekend of the Christmas markets, so there's a lot more people coming into Manchester. And we also heard from the inspector that was giving the briefing there how the officers were already stretched, going out to calls all over the place before the briefing had even started. So to know that he's got you on the ground, you and your team, as an extra pair of eyes and ears must really be a good thing for the police. Yeah, we work very closely with the police. We work alongside them, so we're there for their eyes and ears a lot of the time, really. OK, well, the briefing's done, so let's get on with it, Andy. I'm in your hands. Thank you. OK, this way. Here in Manchester, there are over 2,000 licensed premises. That's a pretty big pub crawl. And with the Christmas market bringing in the crowds, we could be in for a busy night. So, just already coming out, do you get the feel that it is a little bit busier now that it is coming into the festive season? You can immediately see, as we're walking out, there's two lines of cars which are not usually in place. We've got groups of people over here on the right-hand side that are congregating near a cash machine. Okay. Immediately, we can see more people on the street than what we usually see. Alcohol-related situations account for much of the work they do, and in a city of busy roads, the dangers are everywhere. Some of the speed that some people are driving down here, it's all a bit bravado and showing off, I'm sure. But if someone has had too much to drink and they're staggering across the road, that could be serious. Really serious. The potential for people staggering off the curb. Yeah. It, it happens, doesn't it? It happens, yeah. Yeah. It happens. Within 30 minutes of patrolling the streets, the angels get their first call for help. Someone is falling over getting into a taxi here. Right. The ambulance has already been called. Okay. Had the ambulance not been here, this is something that you would... We would definitely have picked this up, yeah. We would definitely have helped that person, yeah. given them initial first aid and called an ambulance straight away for them. The volunteers come from all walks of life and have all sorts of reasons for giving up their evenings to look out for others. But for Andy, it's personal. Why did you become a street angel? A younger colleague of mine had too much to drink. He was in a bad way and because he'd been sick and he was... There was lots of people that were just walking past him and weren't, weren't right. looking after him. So I, I started off by getting him 
by helping him really and getting him, making sure that you know he was he was in a safe safe enough to get home. Right. It's so reassuring to know for, for loved ones that you, there's somebody there that will at least be looking out for them. Team, we're going to turn right at these lights, so we've got a guy just on the right-hand side here, guys. Okay. This gentleman, if you want to just check he's all right. What made you think he needs look, looking so at? Basically, he was bent over, facing the ground. It looked like he, he, he was unsteady on his feet. Uh, he was leaning against the wall. Basically. From the position he was in, it looked like he could have been possibly been sick, exactly. he might have been unwell, he could have been attacked, it could have been anything, couldn't it, from a distance? We don't know until we, until we approach them, really, yeah, so that, that's why we're there. But you can see he's having a bit of a laugh and a joke yeah, with the team. Yeah, so, so what we'll do now is I'll probably call the team back and we'll, we'll move on. I reckon just cross over, we're just, there's a nightclub just on the right, that next one, just have a quick look at 42s. Thankfully, it's been a quiet night for the volunteers. But the countdown to Christmas is only just beginning. So, Andy, we're just finishing the shift now. Um, although there was lots of people out and about, in your terms, you think this was a quiet shift? Very quiet shift, really. We're there to, to reassure people and smile and laugh and joke with people. We want people to enjoy themselves. We want people to get home safely. And tonight, it's a job well done. Well, it's a cold night, it's Christmas. I think it's time to get the kettle on, don't you? Fantastic. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go, team. And he's just said he's going to make everyone a cup of tea. <laughs> After weeks of hard work, Gotham Hotel is adding the final touches to their Christmas preparations. <laughs> Two Nutcracker statues take pride of place outside the hotel. Inside, the pièce de résistance is their £15,000 baby grand piano. The piano is in place, the wines are ready, decorations are in place, toy soldiers are outside. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, tonight is the night when it all comes together. Tonight, Mario, the hotel manager, will be hosting Gotham's first Christmas party, and he's invited a VIP guest to the celebrations, local businessman Simon Lote. Hi, it's my favourite piano man. Good evening. Good You're right. You. Good to see you, Simon. Thank Welcome you. back. Thank you very much. Shall we... Uh, yeah, let's have a quick look. Simon owns an independent music shop in the heart of the city and has supplied the expensive piano for their Christmas festivities. Yes, the Christmas has officially arrived. Our first Christmas party is this evening. Yes, tonight is going to be an exceptional night, I think. Yes. Mario is hoping that it was money well spent, but will this beautiful instrument hit the right note with the hotel's discerning clientele? It's lovely that they've got a nice grand piano playing nice Christmas music, great ambience for a nice dinner. It was lovely to see Mario so happy with the piano, the piano fitting in perfectly with his Christmas decorations. The fact that he's using it by itself and with a pianist, I think he's getting the most benefit out of it. So, yeah, he's happy, I'm happy. Well, what a lovely show today has been. It's been great to see you out with a bunch of volunteers doing so much at this time of year. Yeah, the street angels are great, giving up so much of their time. And tomorrow, I'm out with another group of people whose aim is to keep us all safe, the police, as I patrol with them the busy Christmas city centre. And we'll be joining the pupils of St Trinity's High School as they prepare for their Christmas carol service, where they're blessing the Manchester crib at St Anne's Church. So, we'll see, see you then. then. An explanation from Mary that leaves Joseph devastated when our drama for Christmas week continues. The Nativity, today on BBC One at 3.20. Well, it's flavours of the festive season to come in the Christmas kitchen. Next.